Good morning. Uh, the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions will please come to order. This morning, we're holding our fourth hearing on stabilizing premiums and ensuring access to insurance in the individual health insurance market for 2018. Senator Murray and I will each have an opening statement, then we'll introduce our five witnesses. Welcome to you. After their testimony, senators will have an opportunity to ask the witnesses five minutes of, of questions. To begin with, we ought not to take for granted the three hearings this committee has had over the last 10 days. For seven years, hardly a civil word was spoken between Republicans and Democrats on the Affordable Care Act. It was Trump Care versus Obamacare day in and day out. But for the last 10 days, senators from both sides of the aisle have engaged in serious discussion for several hours at a time about what Congress can do between now and the end of this month to help limit premium increases for 18 million Americans next year and begin to lower premiums in the future and also to prevent insurers from leaving the markets where those 18 million Americans buy insurance. Last week, between the meetings held before our hearings, such as the one we had today, and the hearings themselves, for two consecutive days, half of the members of the United States Senate participated in bipartisan conversations about getting a result on health insurance. I want to thank Senator Murray once again for her leadership in helping make that happen. These have been focused hearings. They've been bipartisan hearings. Uh, as, and, and I think they've been refreshing for most of the members of the senators who are hungry for that sort of opportunity to see if we can work together to get a result. At last week's hearings, we heard from state insurance commissioners, then from governors, and on Tuesdays from experts in state flexibility. And during those hearings, three themes, three themes emerged, in my opinion, that represent a working consensus for stabilizing premiums in the individual insurance market in 2018. First, the first theme is congressional approval of continued temporary funding of the cost-sharing payments that reduce co-pays and deductibles for many low-income Americans on the exchanges. Second, senators from both sides of the aisle suggested expanding the so-called copper plan already in the law so anyone, not just those 29 or under, could purchase a lower premium, higher deductible plan that keeps a medical catastrophe from turning into a financial catastrophe. And third, this was advocated by state insurance commissioners, governors, and senators from both sides of the aisle, give states more flexibility in the approval of coverage, choices, and the prices for health insurance. Most of the discussion about flexibility is centered on amending Section 1332 State Innovation Waiver because it's already a part of the Affordable Care Act. In looking at 1332, we heard a number of common sense suggestions of how to, about how to improve and speed up the process, such as reducing the six-month application review period and allowing a copycat application so that if Senator Murray's state gets something approved, why can't Tennessee come along and say, we want to do what Washington State did with one change? Such changes will make it easier for states to use 1332 waivers to create programs like the reinsurance program in Alaska or the invisible high-risk pool in Maine to help cover higher-cost individuals. At Tuesday's hearing on state flexibility, witnesses recommended how to amend 1332 to give states the authority to offer a larger variety of health insurance plans with varying benefits and payment rules. That was discussed extensively at our hearing on Tuesday by all five witnesses. And several witnesses suggested that actuarial equivalency, they use those two words, is a useful way to do that. That means in effect that while states might be able to offer plans with varying levels of benefits, that the value of those plans to consumers has to be similar to the plans currently offered on the Affordable Care Act exchanges or the individual market. At our hearing on Tuesday, former Governor Michael Levitt, a former Secretary of Health and Human Services, suggested that with this approach, plans would be of equal value but wouldn't have to be carbon copies of one another. He used a car as an example. He said if you looked at several $25,000 cars, one might have a backup camera, 
One might have more horsepower, but they're still $25,000 cars. So health plans might have different benefits, but they have to be of the same value to the consumer. He testified that this actuarial equivalence would give states, in his words, the ability to construct an option menu of benefits and provide either the state or even consumers with the ability to choose plans that weigh those differently, unquote. The governor of Massachusetts made a similar suggestion last week at our hearing. He said that with current regulations and guidance, 1332 waivers are administered in such a way that Massachusetts can't offer anything but an existing Affordable Care Act exchange plan. Governor Baker testified, quote, greater flexibility is also needed around benefit design. Value-based insurance design approaches to benefit design seek to align patients' out-of-pocket costs, such as co-payments and deductibles, with the value of services. He continued, Massachusetts is committed to providing access to quality, affordable health insurance for our residents, rather than walking away from that commitment. We believe that increased flexibility would allow us to meet this commitment in more effective ways. End of quote. This type of approach to insurance allows individuals the opportunity to have a more personalized health insurance plan. It can benefit healthy individuals as well as those with complex and chronic medical conditions. I made clear at Tuesday's hearings, and I want to repeat, that I'm not in any way proposing that we change the patient protection guardrails already written in Section 1332, including the pre-existing condition protections, that nobody can be charged more if they have a pre-existing condition, and that everyone is guaranteed to be sold insurance. The requirement that your insurance policy can't be rescinded, that those under 26 may remain on their parents' insurance, and there may be no annual lifetime limits on your health benefits. That's not a part of the proposal, changing any of that. Our goal is to see if we can come to a consensus by early next week so that we can hand, Senator Murray and I could hand, with hopefully the support of several Republicans and Democrats, could hand Senator McConnell and Schumer an agreement that Congress can pass by the end of the month that will help limit premium increases for 18 million Americans next year and begin to lower premiums after that, and to prevent insurers from leaving the market where these 18 million Americans buy insurance. So that's our schedule. Now, what happens if we don't succeed? Last year, 4% of American counties had one insurance company on the exchange. This year, 36% have one insurer on the exchange. And for 2018, CMS tells us that one half of counties will have one or zero insurers on the exchange. In Tennessee, it's 78 of 95 counties. And we've heard from the state insurance commissioners that this by itself, this monopoly in so many counties, drives up premiums because it creates those monopolies. Without cost sharing reductions, has been pointed out by several senators, the Congressional Budget Office, the Joint Committee on Taxation, and our witnesses, has, witnesses have said that premiums will increase an additional 20% in 2018. So premiums go up 20%, the federal debt goes up $194 billion over 10 years to pay for the higher premiums, and 5% of the people will be living in Bear counties after just one year. That's according to CBO and Joint Tax and our witnesses. So let's keep in mind also that even if President Trump wanted to extend the cost-sharing payments, the courts might not allow him to do that unless we act. The Federal District Court of District of Columbia has said that the president, whether it's President Obama or President Trump, does not have the authority to continue cost-sharing reduction payments because Congress never appropriated the funds. That's what the court said. I want a result, and a part of a result that limits premiums in 2018 and begins to lower premiums in the future is flexibility for states in the approval of coverage choices and prices. To get a result, Republicans will have to agree to something that many don't want to agree to, additional funding through the Affordable Care Act. And Democrats will have to agree to something that some are reluctant to agree to, and that's more flexibility for states. That's called a compromise. I simply can't go to the Republican majority in the Senate, the Republican majority in the House, and to the Republican president to extend the cost-sharing payments without giving states more meaningful flexibility. Now to today's hearing. Today we're looking at what patients are facing 
if we don't reach a compromise. For example, we'll hear from a patient, a doctor, in a hospital about what happens when an insurance plan leaves your state and when you lose your doctor in the middle of your care. It's clear that to truly protect patients, we need to stabilize the market, limit premium increases, and begin to lower premiums in the future. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, Senator.